pretty good.
you please stand for our psalm reading this morning? And after that worship and where our hearts are, let's say these words, which are God's words to us, that we also speak back to him. And when we speak it back to him in God's power and power through the Holy Spirit, so read the words and, and say with meaning what they mean to you and what God is speaking to you. The heavens declare the glory of God. The, us, Let's start one more time. You guys ready? One, two, three. Everybody together. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that uh, your truth and the kingdom of heaven is reigning out on the earth right now. And as we talk about the kingdom of heaven, Lord, we desire your presence and your glory and who you are to be here, Lord, because Jesus Christ came that we would experience the glory of God, your glory, your presence, your love, your mercy, all your characteristics, Lord. And as we accept and believe in this beautiful gift of grace that Jesus Christ came to give each one of us freely, as we accept and receive that, Lord, that you give us this kingdom, Father that we are able to receive this. And Lord, even when we look around, Lord, we don't necessarily see it in our world today in every aspect with our own eyes or that we hear it. But Father, the kingdom is all around us. And Jesus said it is at hand. And Lord, we are reaching out in the name of Jesus to receive all that you have for us, Lord. And that we would look beyond this world, look beyond the things that uh, take up our time and distract us and look and see and focus on Jesus Christ. The character and the love and the mercy that he came to give us, and that as we look upon him, everything else will fade away, and that we would carry Jesus with us through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, that Jesus said, I have left you the Holy Spirit. Here is the gift. It is greater that I go away and that I leave this for you, and that we cherish Jesus. We cherish the Holy Spirit. We cherish our Father God and his glory, and that his glory would shine in us and across this nation, and that the glory of God that is shown through his son Jesus Christ who came to earth will be shown and win back this nation through your people. And Lord, we are your people. We are your children. So Lord, your presence here with us this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Right, I'd like to dismiss the children to Children's Church with Miss Davis in the back. And please stay standing one more time. I know there's a lot of standing in church, I'm sorry. But we have a, one, one more scripture this morning. Our scripture is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is written, it has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I love that psalm reading this morning. It's the glory of God which is the representation of his presence and his kingdom is pouring forth over the whole earth right now. It's happening right now. We've been talking about the kingdom of God, and the glory is directly tied to his kingdom. The kingdom of God is his presence through Jesus Christ, which came, which we have access to who he is in the kingdom of God right now, which Jesus explained throughout the scriptures. He said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And he said, those who have ears to hear and those who have ears to, or eyes to see, let them see, let them hear that the kingdom of God is here. And he said, 
I am the kingdom. I am in your presence. Jesus Christ is the kingdom. Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. It's not just an example. It's living in him. When we are baptized, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. We are following in his footsteps, but through the Holy Spirit that's living in us. And it's not the word of God is not just an example saying this is how we live. And it's like any other self-help. It's Jesus Christ living inside of us, working his will and his way out in our life, every part of our lives. And his glory is evident. That's what the psalm says. It says his glory is evident. If you just open your eyes, open your hearts, open your ears, the glory of God, you look at the skies, you look at the sunrise, you look at the sunset, you look at the beauty and the majesty of his creation, which even in what we look at today is something that is falling apart and being falling and decaying because it wasn't originally what he created. It's even his majesty is in the glory of what we see in our lives. The majesty of God is in every life in this room. If you just take a look around at the person sitting next to you, the glory of God is evident in one another, especially in the Holy Spirit pouring forth out of our own hearts into one another people. This is the glory of God, and it is evident. It is evident. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that in in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. The glory and the kingdom and the majesty and the power, kingdom of God and his glory go hand in hand. I was thinking this week and reflecting on <laughs> the kingdom of God, which we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, because we're in in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, and Jesus is go out after he is baptized, and he said, John the Baptist was in prison. He goes out, and he starts preaching the kingdom of God. After he was baptized was the first thing that he started doing. And I was thinking about the kingdom of God, which is here now. Yes, are we in agreement? The kingdom of God is here. It's come through Jesus Christ. We have access to the kingdom of God. But then I was reflecting on the kingdom of the world reflecting on the kingdom of God and then the kingdom of the world, which is run, the kingdom of the world is run by who? Satan. Satan. Kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. And I was thinking about one brings life, one brings death. And I was thinking about 4th of July and celebrating Independence Day. And, and what came to me, I was actually prayer time on Tuesday morning, and I was praying and closing my eyes, and the picture of the, of the flag came. And this, this idea of O Glory, which is what the flag is named, O Glory, right? And I, what the picture in my mind was a flag that was tattered and torn and falling apart like it's been through a battle. And I know when we think about O Glory, when we think about the flag, we get a nostalgia about us and thinking about what we have made it through. But what really hit my heart is that the glory has faded in the opening scripture. I, we look at the flag, we look at the glory of what this country has started out. It started out on the foundation of God and said these truths are self-evident under our creator and that's what this country has started on. That's where the brilliance and the blessing and the glory of God came out in our nation but now the glory has faded and we've turned to our own kingdom. If you look at the government and how this country is run now and I'm not it's self-evident. I'm not trying to run down the United States, but it's self-evident where we are that this country does not reflect the glory and majesty of God, which it was originally founded on. And to me, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart in looking at it, no longer shining in its brilliance. And the glory has faded. But God's glory never fades. When we put our trust in him as a people, as a country, and let him be king, right? We talked about last couple of weeks, where is the kingdom of God? Wherever Jesus Christ is king. Is Jesus Christ king of the government? Would you say Jesus Christ right now has been put in place as king over our government? No. He's still king whether we put him there or not. But no wonder we don't see the kingdom of God around us. But it should come through the body of Christ and the church when we 
put Jesus as king in our lives, that's where it comes. And the glory comes, his brilliance and who he is, is seen. It made me think of uh, Samuel. It's like we've taken this beautiful gift that God gave us. We first gave it to him and said, this country is yours. Lord, you rule over it. And then we took it back. It's like the Israelites said to Samuel, said, we want a king like all the other nations. <laughs> and God said to Samuel, was really upset because he was kind of ruling Israel at that time. And he was said that he was rejected. And God said, no, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And we've set up our own kingdom. What seems right to a man only leads to what? Death. We do things in this country that seems right to a man but don't honor God. But that can change. I was listening this week to a, uh, uh, Ann Graham Lotz. Does anybody know Ann Graham Lotz? She's the daughter of Billy Graham. And someone had sent me a, a video that she spoke on the National Day of Prayer. And I looked at it, and of course, I get busy. I get other videos. I don't get a chance to look at everything. Then I was praying some quiet time and listening to this uh, 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 prayer. It's International House of Prayer. I listen on the computer while I study the word. And it's 24 hours prayer and worship all the time. It doesn't stop. It's, uh, they have somebody, different people come up for two different hours, worship teams, and they worship the Lord 24 hours all the time, and they stream it live. And I was listening to that, and I've never heard anything but music on that. But then all of a sudden, the music stopped, and somebody comes out and starts speaking. It just kind of stopped. And they started talking about Anne Graham Lotz and what she was talking about in this video. So I just said, okay, Lord, I guess I better watch this video. Lord got my attention. And she was preaching on Joel, chapter 1. And she was preaching about awakenings. It's self-evident when we look around us in our country that it's not being run by Jesus Christ. That stuff is self-evident. When it happened in Joel's time, it happened with a famine, and locusts came and ate up all their crops. And they said this is, that nothing like this has ever happened before. And it was to awaken them. It wasn't to bring destruction on them because God was bringing his wrath on them. He was trying to wake them up because they were on a path towards death. They were on a path towards death. God doesn't allow calamity to come in our lives just to harm us. He allows it because the calamity is coming through eternal death when we stray from God. And Israel was straying from God. Our country as a people are straying from God. And the calamities that happen are to wake us up and to bring us back into his presence. I was reading this morning about the Israelites when they were sent into exile into Babylon. And the scripture said in Malachi said so they would be redeemed. They were sent away into slavery so that they would wake up and be redeemed. They would wake up and be redeemed. She mentioned two things and she said, has anything happened like this in our generation? And the one thing she said, two unique things that have happened in most of our lifetimes, not all of our lifetimes. And number one is that Israel, this ancient, uh, ancient group of people, have moved back into their homeland, their ancient land. After 2,000 years, they've been in exile. And in 1940, whatever, 45, maybe after World War II, they were put back into their land. Nothing like that has ever happened. 2,000 years, they've been scattered, and they've been put back into their land. The second thing that she said is another thing that's like, has anything ever happened like this to wake us up is that the gospel, the word of God is actually in virtually every single country. The perforation, proliferation of the word of God has spread out through by and far through the internet, through the church and through Bibles and the books and the availability of the word of God is almost everywhere. Not that everybody has received it, but the proliferation of the word of God is almost over the whole world. Two things that are happening right now, and she said, wake us up. The scripture is telling us to wake up to what's going on around us. The glory has faded, but Christ's glory never fades. And it shows us where we're putting our trust, where we're putting our focus, where we're putting our time. There's environmental disasters, social disasters, financial disasters, national disasters, spiritual disasters. And we say, everything's okay. That's what the Israelites did. 
the prophets, the false prophets said, no, everything's going to be okay. There's going to be peace. We have to be, look and see it as evidence. Something is happening. God is doing something, and he wants us to respond to what's going on. What does that mean to you in your life? How does Christ want you to respond to the things that are self-evident to what's going on around you? We can easily say, it's, oh, it's up to somebody else. But we have the solution, yes? Not even just the right answer. We have the solution in a life of Christ and the Holy Spirit living inside of us. The kingdom of God. How Christ lives as king shown in our lives. We have that solution to bring to the world. That's what Jesus not only just says, it's not just an option. He says, I command you to do it out of joy. Out of joy. Do you guys treasure what you have in the salvation, this great gift of grace? Do you guys treasure this. We talked about it last night. The man who goes into a field, he said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man who goes into the field and finds his great treasure, so he goes and sells everything so he can buy that field. Is the joy of your salvation evident in your life? Is the king reigning is evident in your life, shown to people around you? The glory of God. The kingdom of God shows the glory of God. And the glory is his weightiness in the Old Testament. The word for glory shows his weightiness and who he is. And when we look at the kingdom of God, guess what? When we look at the nation and all the problems, guess what? All that stuff is nothing. God can restore and redeem anything in a heartbeat. And he will. And he is going to. But we have to live in the kingdom right now. Live in the kingdom right now. In Joel 2, 18, he says, Make new and restore all that was lost that the locusts have eaten. And Joel 28, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Everybody. I will pour out my spirit the Holy Spirit living inside of you, the glory of God, the kingdom of God, Jesus as king, all is one. That's how the kingdom of God is manifested in your life. Acts 14, 21 through 22, the return to Antioch and Syria said they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith says, we must go through hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Oh, I don't like that. We must go through hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Releasing the things that are kings in our life right now. What's ruling your life? What's most important? Where do you spend all of your time, most of your time? Whatever that is, it's ruling you. It's your king. But it says we must go through hardships. I think it's, it's suffering brings out graces that cannot be seen in times of health. Suffering brings out truth and reality, what's really going on, rather than sitting and being isolated and denying what's going on. We do that as, a, as this whole country is doing that. They're denying the reality of what's going on, and they're denying the message that Christ brings. It happened in the Old Testament and continues to happen today. This is a pattern, and God is saying, wake up. Wake up. Live differently. Live like you're a child of the king. Make choices and decisions that honor the king. Choices and decisions to allow him to rule and reign and submit to what he wants you to do in his life. And it brings about the suffering, weans us from the kingdom of this world because we're stuck in the kingdom of this world. Think about it right now. What part of the kingdom of this world do you feel stuck and the Lord's trying to draw you out of, but it's painful and difficult? Something way that you're living, something that you're doing that's taking up most of your time may not even be a bad thing, but it's not a kingdom thing because it's not instituted and run by the king, Jesus Christ. What is keeping you from that in your life and weaning from that? That causes suffering. But God doesn't do it to harm us. He does it to liberate us and bring freedom. Where the Spirit is, there is freedom to free you from the bondage of sin. 
the bondage of sin in your life. Bondage is sin that's over this world. The bondage of the kingdom of this world that has people entrapped. You have the freedom living inside of you. It's not just a teaching. It's a person. The Bible isn't just a book. This is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word. And the Holy Spirit is Jesus. It says it's Christ's Spirit here in us, living in us. In the New Testament, the word glory, doxazo, is usually meant to convey a sense of brilliance or radiance. And it's talked about in Matthew 6, 29, about Solomon and his glory and all the kingdoms of the glory of the world in their glory. But in Matthew 4, it talks most commonly the word glory in Greek is used to describe the brilliance of those who share or, or participate in kingdom glory. The glory, word glory, is usually applied to us. Us participating in the glory of God. The brilliance and the radiance of Christ in our lives. The glory of God, the kingdom in our lives. Think about at the Mount of Transfiguration. It was literally glowing. As they saw Jesus with Moses and Elijah and the transfiguration, they were literally glowing with the brilliance and the glory of God. And so it wasn't just Jesus, it was also Moses and Elijah. And we are no different than Moses or Elijah. We are men just like them in the presence of Jesus Christ. And the glory of God was shining. Amazing. Amazing. Psalm 145.10 says, All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. To focus on his kingdom. How do you guys focus on the kingdom of God? How do we focus on the kingdom of God? Anybody? It's not a rhetorical question. So yeah? Amen. What else? Amen. Amen. The Word of God. How much time do you guys devote to those things in your life, to kingdom things, to Jesus? You can take Jesus with you with whatever you're doing. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Be in a constant contact and relationship with Jesus Christ. I love this quote. I read this this week. It says, we reflect what we see and what we hear and what we are in the presence of. I know a lot of times I, I ask you guys to uh, self-examine. <laughs> Where are you at? What's going on in your heart? Where is Christ speaking to you right now? Where is the Holy Spirit moving you in a different direction? Where is the Holy Spirit asking you to let go of something? But I read this quote this week, and it says, it says this, and it's by uh, Robert Murray McShane. He was a preacher, a pastor, Scottish preacher in the 1700s. And it says, we learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. I love that. He is altogether lovely. Live much in the smiles of God. Bask in his beams. Feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose in his almighty arms. I think sometimes we can get bogged down in self-examination. Self-examine your heart. We're going to take the Lord's Supper together as the body of Christ this morning to celebrate Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, given us his body and his blood. Together, we do that. But we don't stay in self-examination. I love that. For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Jesus Christ. Take a look at his kingdom, his glory, who he is. Let him overwhelm you. Do you guys remember what it was like when you guys were first saved? When you first came to that understanding, there's a way out of my sin in my life? Were you guys overwhelmed with this, uh, this free gift? Say, I don't even have to do anything, but I just can accept it. I can accept it. He took my place. And you felt his presence and his love and his glory wash over you. And they had that joy of salvation. 
I was thinking about it this week. I was thinking, where, where is that? Do you guys feel that? Or does the glory of God feel veiled in your life? Does it feel covered? Does it feel dulled? Like the glory was when Moses came down from the mountain with God and he veiled it over his face. And guess what? The, the Israelites were, were felt, they felt uh, exposed in the brilliance and the glory of God. They didn't even want it around because they'd rather live by their laws than live in the presence of God. In the presence of the glory of God, what happens? When the presence of light, darkness is shown. They didn't like that because it showed who they were and how they were living. And so they went back to who they were and what they were doing. They didn't want that. And then the glory faded. And that was the old covenant. But through the new covenant, Jesus, the glory doesn't fade. Praise God, it doesn't go away. I was reading this story about uh, this week during the Civil War. I was thinking about this. This war had been fought. And it was the bloodiest in our history. And a president had been assassinated. And a amendment was taken to the Constitution, had been signed into law. And once enslaved men, women, and children were now legally emancipated. Yet amazingly, many continued living in fear and squalor as though they had never happened. In the context of hard-earned freedom, slaves chose to remain as slaves. Ah, that hit me this week. Sometimes we choose to live. We, you've got the freedom. Yes, Jesus Christ is done. He's taken care of it. We don't have to do anything for it, but yet we still live like we used to live. Is that the kingdom of God? He died that we may be free. He emancipated us. Do you guys still feel free? Where's the joy of your salvation? Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Robert McShane had another quote this week, and he said, he said this that I read. It's, it described glow-in-the-dark believers. He said, when, uh, when believers do this, he said, Christian person, it's a Christian person who makes it easy for others to God. A glow-in-the-dark Christian is a Christian who makes it easy for other people to believe in God. Do you make it easy for other people to believe in God? That's a tough question. Yeah? A glow-in-the-dark Christian, someone who's in the presence and the glory of God and reflecting the glory of Jesus Christ and the majesty and him being king and being joyful about it, joyful about Christ as king in your life, that makes it easy for others to come to believe. Makes it easy for others to come to God through Jesus Christ. I read an illustration this week. It's about uh, Brazil. They've done something unique in Brazil. They've uh, had flooding, thousands of square miles in flooding in the forests of Brazil, and it's given birth to an unusual industry. One man in general saw that there was millions of tree trunks that are under these lakes that are uh, overflowed from all the flooding in Brazil. And this gentleman, he decided to, uh, he came up with an invention of an underwater chainsaw. It's an electric chainsaw that's underwater. And so they have these lumberjacks that gear up scuba gear, and they get these electric chainsaws, and they go down, and they, they take these trunks, and they saw them off. And rather than the trunks as a lumberjack, being a lumberjack's pretty dangerous. The, you're falling, a tree falling down, and these trees fall up. Because once they are cut free from the roots, they float up to the top, and then they harvest these logs. And it's a huge industry, million-dollar industry, because they have thousands of square mile lakes and all this wood that's underneath there. And it made me think about this, that uh, in the kingdom of God, that's what it's like, that we live by a different set of rules, where we think that the, the, uh, uh, the trees fall down, the trees fall up. Things happen differently in the kingdom of God. Things happen differently. When we trust him, there's a different set of laws and rules when we work through Christ in our lives. And this is what he calls us to. This is what he calls us to. I love the opening song. Did you guys look at those words on the opening song? Did you guys remember? Do you guys remember what the opening song is? No? What was it? Anybody know what the opening song was? 
Worship team's got to know. What was the opening song? Build your kingdom here. I love that word. Have you guys actually listened to those words in that song? Build your kingdom here. It says, Kim, come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildflower in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. Do you guys believe that? Do you guys hunger for that? Oh, that's not very hungry. I bet you guys are more physically hungry than spiritual hungry. You guys are going, can't wait for lunch. Can't wait for the food that's out there. The Lord put on my heart earlier this week, and I'm going to say it, and, I, and I, even this morning, he put some words on my heart, which are kind of silly words, but it really seemed to hit home, and that I feel like sometimes we're in spiritual hibernation. We've been given this beautiful gift, and it's powerful, majestic, glorious, and yet it's in hibernation. I mean, does anybody feel like sometimes it's hibernation? Does anybody feel like it's been kind of the glory has been dulled in our life? From when you first came to the Lord, first came to the Lord, this beauty, glorious, saving grace, living in grace. Grace is not just the gift so we can have eternal life. It's living in a life of grace in the kingdom of who Jesus is. Who wants it to be a little bit more clear? Anybody want it clear in your life? Anybody want the veil pulled off? So that's what I want to pray this morning. I want to pray, and I, I, everybody, I want everybody to close their eyes. And I just, uh, it was on my heart that, uh, that, and I do this with baptism. I do this with baptism. I say to people, uh, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then do you believe he died for your sins? And then I say, do you believe he rose on the third day to bring you life? And then the last question I ask is, are you willing to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit as Jesus desires in your life? And that's the question I want to ask this morning. I'm not saying you've never had the Holy You're saved. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's in hibernation. But are you wanting and desiring, hungering and thirsting for the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life this morning? If you do, I'd like you to raise your hand. I'd like you to raise two hands. <laughs> I'd like you to stand up. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we desire for you to build your kingdom here. And Lord, we recognize that uh, we can't, we just can't live this way anymore. Lord, that we desire more. A sure sign of grace is somebody who desires more of it. And Lord, we desire more of you. If, we've ever, if you have ever experienced Jesus Christ in your life, you desire more. We desire more of you. Whatever that looks like, whatever that is, we desire your rule and reign in our lives that your kingdom would be built here. When we say built here, build it in us first, Lord. Not just in this building or this place, but build your kingdom in our hearts and in our lives. And that the fullness of your glory, the fullness of your presence would be manifest in us, Lord. Every day as we walk around, everything that we see, we would see different. Things would be upside down. Trees would fall up. And we would see the reality, your true reality. And trust and follow you wherever you are, wherever you go, wherever you're working. We'll follow you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I'd like to invite the Stephen ministers up for a time of prayer. And um, the worship team, please come up. This is a, uh, I was praying this this morning. I said, Lord, whatever you want to do this morning, it's your call, whatever you want to do. And I was praying over all the seats this morning. So every seat that you seat you're sitting in has been prayed over. Pray, prayed over on Wednesday night. Actually, we prayed over it, and I prayed over it again this morning. And the Lord wants to do something special in you that you would be open to receive that. If you need prayer with somebody, we have people to pray with. Chuck and Emily in the back. Doug and Anna in the back. There's lots of people 
that can pray, would be willing to pray with you. There's nothing special about the people who pray other than we're just a brother and sister in Christ and that we lift each other up. So I encourage you, if the Lord moves you, don't sit in your chair. Please get up and go to whoever the Lord's leading you in prayer. Whatever that is, now's the time. As we are here worshiping God, listen to his word, which is powerful and mighty, and that we're basking in his presence, keeping our eyes focused on him as the scripture said, that we are transformed as we contemplate the glory of God. We are transformed.